right, I think we're all going. Hi, everyone. Um, a big welcome to our first Ask NSAD live session for this year. Um, if you're new to the group or you've not seen any of the live sessions before, um, we tend to have a couple each term. They're around 30 minutes long, um, really informal and totally open sessions. Um, in each session, we'll focus on a different area or art form or topic. Um, so if there's any topics you'd like to see in any of the lives going forward, um, please let us know and we'll certainly try and make that happen. Um, today we're joined by Paul Carney. Paul is an NCAD member, um, he's a former NCAD council member and he's an art and design consultant. Um, he's delivered special CPD art, CPD sorry, in schools, colleges, galleries, universities and everything else all, all around the UK. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we often hear through our kind of primary art community that actually drawing is one of the most daunting art forms especially if you're new to kind of primary art leadership um, so this evening Paul will kind of talk us through some of the process of teaching drawing in the primary phase um, and we're going to do a nice little drawing exercise as well so if you haven't already go and grab your pens or your pencils and your paper um, and we'll get started so hi Paul hello hi Di Di Diane nice to be here thanks so much for joining us it's lovely to have you here and to start right. off the, uh, the new term um, so I was giving you a very, very brief introduction, but I think we're going to go straight into drawing or do you want to? No, we'll go straight into doing a drawing exercise before anything else. Shall I just share me? Shall I just share my screen? Great. That's perfect. OK, so I'll just start from the beginning. You see that OK, yeah? Yeah, see that? That's perfect. Okay, so I'm just going to do this contour drawing exercise, which is an exercise in skill and control. And so I'll just play it. I'll just skip through it on from YouTube. So I'd just like you to do this really simple, uh, quick exercise now. And that's, I'd just like you to just draw, uh, or to write rather, a letter. I'm going to draw the letter H and just, like I said, just do it. Sorry, has that gone off? Has the sound? Yeah, I think that's just disappeared there, has it? Sorry, that was me. I'll just... <laughs> I'll just talk you through it. So we're going to just draw a contour line. So we're going to draw any letter that you want. So here you can see I've drawn the letter H. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to draw a contour line around this letter. You can see me silently demonstrating that. <laughs> And I've got a dodgy pen with this video as well, so. That's uh, so probably quite realistic for a lot of people at home. Then, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So effectively what you've done, you've turned that capital letter into a block letter, haven't you? Mm-hmm. You can do it with any capital letter. But then I want you to keep going. I want you to keep drawing more contour lines around your capital letter. A famous artist used to do this a lot, and she used to do it at school as well, and I used to do this at school, and it was Bridget R Riley used to do this. Oh, really? I feel like I'm getting better at each uh, contour line that I'm doing. <laughs> the yeah, you will. now looking really unimpressive. <laughs> yes. Yeah, definitely. And if you keep going, and a really good test is, can you draw a contour line inside one of the contour lines you've already drawn? No, no is the answer for me. <laughs> no, not yet, anyway. <laughs> 
And what you've done there is, is you've created a contour line pattern. And you can extend that in different ways. You might color it in with felt tip pens, or you might get uh, felt tip pens and draw patterns inside each of the, con the, con the contours and do maybe zigzags inside one contour line and dots inside another. You might draw a chessboard. Sometimes I used to draw join the corners up. So if you join the corners of your letter up with a diagonal line, it looks like maybe a py py pyramid from above. Um, or it might look like a tunnel that's disappearing into the distance. Um, and if you do this with children in classrooms, they're learning some really important skills with a pencil or a pen, and they're learning what used to be called draftsmanship. And it's just basically skill and control. And it's basically the ability to realize our intentions with a pen or a pencil. And can I, can I make lines where I want them to actually be? And that's, that's a pretty kind of pivotal skill really, isn't it? And I think maybe in the past, I don't know whether teachers today uh, don't do this, but certainly we used to do it in the past. We used to think that uh, skill and control was something we learned purely through observational draw, drawing that we had to draw things and we had to make them look like things in order to be a good artist. And I think if you if you go back in time to uh, our early an ancestors, they would have drawn patterns a lot more than they would have drawn things. And pattern making, I think, is as I've got older, I've come to appreciate that pattern making is is a really profoundly important way to learn art. And I think it's a real foundational way in which you can learn skills in art. Um, and I absolutely love drawing patterns. And you'll see pupils doing doodles and they'll just happily doodle for hours and hours and hours, but then remarkably turn around and tell you that they can't draw. Well, you know, that, that's something that's going kind of wrong there, isn't it? So this simple e exercise of contour drawing, and it doesn't have to be a letter. You could start with a shape. You could start with a heart shape or a cross shape or any kind of shape and just begin drawing contours around it. So that's my first little drawing activity. Did that's you want to... that. That's a... <laughs> relaxing to do as I was going I feel like I got a bit lost in uh, doing all the lines there <laughs> yes I'm one of those people who if I'm in a conference or I'm in a meeting I'll sit and doodle and I'll draw things like this and I'll if you have like uh, a printed stationery I'll do contour lines around all of my stationery kind of uh, le letterheads and I love to doodle if I can listen and draw at the same time <laughs> Oh, great. Well, we've got a few questions for you, Paul. So should we move on to those? Yeah, definitely, and yeah. Carry on with the contour lines as we go. And I've, I've also put in the chat there that if anyone has any questions they want to ask, um, Paul, do put them into the chat and we'll try and get some time at the end to, to go through those. Um, Lovely. Lovely. So I've obviously given you a very, very brief introduction right at the beginning there, Paul, but it'd be fantastic to hear a little bit more about kind of yourself and your experience and um, how yeah. you got to where you are today. Yeah, okay. Um, I shall uh, just uh, show you this slide, which is a, dr a, a slide of some of my artwork. Um, and this is mostly artwork I've done over the last 10 years or so. And most of the, these drawings were done during lockdown, to be honest. Um, I was just one of those who always liked doing art at as a kid, my mum was really good at art and we all used to draw as children. It was like a family art activity, actually. There was four kids and we would all draw along with my mum. People used to tell me I was good at it. I, I think, looking back on it, I was good at it because I used to like doing it and I did it a lot. Um, and so well, I got to 16 and my dad was a builder and he said to me, are you going to come and, on the building site with me, Paul? And I, I was a skinny little weedy kid and I, 
I can't be on a building site, Dad. So I said, I think I'm going to go to art school. And all my teachers and everybody, my dad and family, just thought I was crazy. But I loved it. It was just a brilliant experience. I went to Cleveland College of Art in Middlesbrough, which is now the Northern School of Art. And I just loved it. It was joy in my life. Dropped out at 18, went to work with my dad on the building sites, did a lot of other jobs, salesmanship and all sorts of stuff. And eventually, as a 28-year-old with uh, two kids, a wife and two kids, I did five years uni and I'd re five tough years getting my degree and just fell into teaching, really. I, I, my, 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 my ambition was to just teach to keep the money coming in while I made it in the art world, but it just was so easy to do to earn money from teaching. And um, I drew on and off through teaching, you know, oh, you don't always get time to do the art you'd like. And then just as I've gone into art consultancy and during lockdown, really, I really kind of picked it back up a lot. I had a lot of years of drawing crows. During lockdown, I drew a lot of anatomy. Um, uh, my friend is Alice Roberts, who's an anatomist, and um, um, I drew a lot of um, anatomical uh, drawings and uh, drew in a dissection room at Newcastle University. That was cool, where they were cutting the kind of bodies open and I was sketching them. That was really good. Um, Drew, uh, you see the art critic Valdemar Janajak there, drew him for the Sunday Times. He's become a friend. And then that one of Adam Rutherford in the middle, I uh, won uh, Curio of the Week on his podcast, which was a great thrill because I'm a huge fan of his. And I've just had other uh, drawings at the top there. I drew a lot of uh, microbes and uh, um um bacteria and things, which is one of my current fascinations so yeah that's me as an artist really and i i'm now I, I i'm with uh, the northern school of art and uh, i do a lot of life drawing and a lot of uh, stuff with them which i really enjoy so that's good amazing some absolutely amazing pictures there Paul, as well um so our next question we've got is how do you balance the teaching of art knowledge and skills um, with creativity and expression. Right. Oh, I mean, that that's probably like the million dollar question these days, isn't it? Because it's, it's a really uh, contentious point. And I think I just want to start pretty much with this, which is like your curriculum, really. And your curriculum has to be broad. It has to be balanced. And I think there's a lot of stuff coming out of, Ofsted now, which is more or less saying that if you if you're going down a route of a very narrow curriculum, you're going to uh, be kind of tripped up, really, uh, unless you can really justify yourself rig rigorously that you've got to be always balancing this this aspect of creativity, knowledge and skills. And these are three things we're always balancing. And and it's not one thing. And it never was one thing. It was, you know, I remember 1979 when I was at art school, it was always multi-faceted uh, fa fa approach. And there's, there's lots of kind of arguments now and debates on Twitter and social media that are like, it's like a, listening to a dog chasing its tail, really, where they're trying to all argue these points that are, were kind of... It, it's a non-argument -arg because two things can exist in the same framework because it's such a big thing. I mean, if you just, uh, basically, if I just rattle through some brief history of uh, drawing pedagogy. Um, so up until about the 1950s and the 60s, you, you had like 50 or 60 years from the 18, late eight, uh, 19th century, you had educational psychologists who studied uh, cognitive development through drawing. And there's a lot of big names there, but the one most people know these days is Victor Lohenfeld. And he talked about this stages model of pictorial development. 
And it's important, those are the two words that we're focusing on there, that it's pictorial development. And they said that children's brains go through these stages of scribble stages, pre-schematic and all of this. Um, and that's how children develop as, art, as, art, as artists. Um, and the way you translate that into a classroom is, I mean, this is, this is a rough approximation of how that translates to a classroom, that if you're sequencing the teaching of uh, drawing with line, drawing in a, in, a tr in a pictorial way, you'll learn to draw shapes, then you'll learn how to combine those shapes. And then around the age of uh, six or seven, you there's there's a very important milestone in your brain which is uh you develop uh the ability for logical thought and prior to that you don't really have that in that ability and that's what children are described as when you see children up to the age of six we say oh they're so creative they're so instinctive and they're so intuitive. And that's usually because they haven't got those logical neural networks developed in their brain. And you can tell when it happens is when they're able to orient their drawings on a page and they can draw things the right way up. And they know that, that uh, people are bigger than flowers and this, that and the other. So that's when that's taking place in the brain and then as they get older and that logical network develops they can draw their uh, perspective and similarly with shading i mean the basic areas of shading are just coloring in lessons really and you can see children who do a lot of coloring in as children as they get older and they get to you know year one two and three they seem to be more advanced. We say, oh, they've got this natural skill. But it's not really a skill. They've just done it more at home. They like to do it for for um, for kind of pleasure. It's hard to to speed this up. I've seen some teachers do it. Um, um, uh, there's uh, on Twitter. There's uh, Dal Maynard and there's Dillis and uh, Mandy Barrett at Gomasol who can really speed these processes up and uh, get children more advanced at earlier ages. But you've really got to know what you're doing to be able to do that with large groups. Um, but essentially, they're the stages there. You, you know, you're developing your first stages in reception, probably before reception, to be honest, in nursery, really. And then in reception, you're beginning to, to be able to draw more complex things. And then you know your pre-schematic stage and then your spatial order where you're using the page to draw grass and things like that that begins to develop in your brain and then you hit this wall really there's a big wall people hit of realism around the age of nine and that's where if you can draw things to look realistically you th you will be told you're good at art and if you can't draw things to make them look realistically you think i can't draw and i'm not very good at it and pretty much this is the default human position really any culture in the world pretty much western culture certainly uh, fall into this trap of thinking that pictorial development is art and if i can't do it I, i'm not i'm not an artist um and there, there was a lot of further research that I said this was up to the 50s and the 60s and then pretty much in up the 80s this is uh, Howard Gardner in the 80s um, and he and his team with Helen Davis and uh, Winner they, they looked at a different model where they were looking at aesthetic artistic development and they said young children on this aesthetic uh, modernistic framework young children were very creative as creative as professionals and that that dips it took it's it took a lot of criticism this model but there were other models anna kindler's model in uh the 90s and 2000s where she was pretty much saying similar things that the pictorial model is only telling you uh the development of children who draw pictorially 
and it doesn't tell you about creative forms of drawing. And so what that results in really is that drawing's a very broad domain of art where you're balancing skill and expression. Um, and your ballot, by skill I mean the ability to render your intentions on a paper, on the piece of paper, paper, paper. So I have an intention, my brain wants to draw and I can do it more or less how I intend it. But expression is more uh, aligned with drawing creatively and drawing uh, instinctively. And so you're kind of balancing those two things. And no one is more important than the other, really. Um, and you get a lot of people who are not specialists trying to favour, like, traditional skills. And you get a lot of senior leaders and a lot of people who don't really understand art, like, pushing down that route. I love skills. I am a very skillful artist. But it, it's got to be... We teach a skill and then we creatively apply it. And there's a debate about how what that time frame of that delay is. Some people think you can't be creative until you've mastered a skill. Well, you can because young children are telling you you can. So you teach a skill in a small stage, in a component, and then you apply it in a creative way. I can teach a child how to shade a cube, to draw and shade a cube. And that's brilliant. That's a skill. And we can practice that. We can try to master it. Um, but I don't need to wait for some mystical, unimaginable, unimaginable time before we can uh, execute that skill we've learned. I can say, right, I've taught you how to draw a cube. You've shaded it. You've mastered it in more different forms. All I want you to do now is, is I want you to think of something imaginative that's cube shaped. What can you think of that's cube shaped? Let's have a thing. Skyscraper, that can be cube shaped, couldn't it? An Xbox could be cube shaped. A car's a bit cube shaped. Or you might just draw some dice on a table. Something imaginative and now draw that using the skills you've just learned. And so I think you're kind of always having to teach a skill and then execute it in an imaginative way. And you're always kind of bouncing between those two things. And what that does is it brings uh, motivation. Because if I'm drawing things imaginative and things that I like and things that I'm interested in, I'm applying it in my own personal way. I'm more motivated to want to do it again and that's the really critical thing about drawing is you have to want to keep do, do, doing it and i don't think in education we talk enough about more more motivation when i was a maths teacher you could say to children you have to learn maths parents would say you have to learn it sorry you've got to learn it you've got to study it but with art, they go, no, nah, you don't have to learn art. If you don't want to do it, you don't, you don't have to. So you've got to want to do it. And that's how you do it. You get it through, uh, you get it through creative ap application of the skills we're learning, really. Um, so teach a skill, give them some space. And I would only say as well, this kind of disparity this dichotomy between skill and expression it only really exists in kind of drawing you don't really have these battles and arguments about teaching clay in this way or teaching painting in this way because those drawings such a liberal kind of domain it, it's it can hardly be defined it's so open but painting isn't painting's more it's got more robust walls you've got to learn things before you can paint you've got to learn color you've got to learn texture you've got to learn about brushes and things similarly with ceramics you've got to learn about clay and how to make this and how to do that so there's a lot of disciplinary knowledge in domains 
and and drawings more liberal so there's more arguments about it does that answer the question? <laughs> That's definitely answered the question. No, that was brilliant. Thank you, Paul. We've actually got um, we've got just Make over that. five minutes left. Right, and we've got sorry. Two questions. Um, oh, so yeah, I might go ahead and ask those if that's all right. Yeah. Um, so Michelle Gregson, our general secretary, said, alongside the theory and wisdom, your own work is so beautiful, Paul. Um, it's inspiring to see such visual content. Um, what advice would you give to those primary teachers who lack confidence in their own ability to draw? So you've touched on some bits there, but it's a really good one. That one I would say, um, try to get as many worked examples as you can. So if you don't have the expertise to teach something, then are there any instructional videos you could use? And there are a number of our platforms out there the kind of big ones of uh, um, access art kapow orc academy that have got videos that you can use and play and if you can learn from it there's a lot of good stuff on youtube but it's knowing where the good stuff is and filtering it out from the kind of uh, from the bat but if you can use instructional videos and when i worked with kapow we learned that this really helps on confident teachers that if they've got a video and they can learn from it it gives them the confidence to actually do it and there's a lot of wisdom in just getting stuck in and just doing it and just you know i remember as a young art teacher I was suddenly faced with teaching things I didn't really know. Like I didn't know how to teach printmaking. And so I used to stay behind after work and just give it a go and practice. And the children will be very forgiving of you. They, they, they won't judge you. They won't point and laugh. They were quite happy for you to be struggling. It's not like a maths lesson where you've got to get the answer right. So get stuck in and get help and support where you can. Fantastic, yeah. And I think that's, if anything, that's even better for children, isn't it, to see that you are also learning. You know, that's such yeah, an important Definitely, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and I'll drop in for members that we've actually got a primary section on the NCD website that has lots of these um, kind of skill videos or, or learning resources there as well. So that if you're looking for somewhere to start and, and remember, do jump in there. Um, one thing I, I would just like to say before we go, as I know we're coming to the end, is so, I think there's one thing that I, I think is really important when you're teaching drawing and teaching art, is that particularly the primary phase, you go on Facebook, you see a lot of things where people are posting, either they'll only post six images of their best student's work, or they'll post an image where everybody's work is exactly the same. and that's not very good pra practice if you're doing a drawing activity where everybody's work is ident identical then it's not too bad in small doses that because you're learning a skill but ideally you don't that's got to be a means to it's got to be a stepping stone and y you know you can see beautiful artwork when you can see the skill the teachers taught but there's personal expression and application of that skill so the teacher's written it in such a way that there's some freedom to apply that skill and where you see ima imagination i just don't think we do enough imagination in art and we don't give children the space to be imaginative like what's your thought well, how would you think of this what would you do like what would you think this would look like you know that's what we've got to be doing and and opening children's minds and when you go into a school and you see on a wall these amazingly imaginative drawings that gets me excited because that's what arts should be all about really oh that's fantastic paul well yeah, we've come to time. I mean, we could just keep going, couldn't we? For no, no, that's fine. <laughs> Absolutely fine. It's lovely. It's one of those things you can talk about it forever. And I think I've talked about this far too much, really. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, definitely not. And we've got some lovely comments saying thank you. And lots of people saying, I totally agree with the wisdom of just getting stuck in. And, you know, really nice definition of skill yeah. you've shared. So you know, we really appreciate it. And thank you so much for joining us. Um, I will say that Paul has a further CPD training on drawing in the primary phase. So if you'd like to 
happen to continue that learning, it's well worth checking out. Um, and you can see all of our previous live sessions on the NSAD Inspirations YouTube channel. Um, I'll make sure I post a link in the thread if you haven't got it already. Um, our next live session will be on the 14th of December, uh, which feels really far away, but it's going to come around in no time at all, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah definitely well diana it was lovely and there's plenty more help on my website if anybody wants any more help or they can e they can email me brilliant thank you so much paula i'll pop your email into that thread as well if people do want to get in touch if that's okay yeah that's lovely that's great thank you very much indeed i shall stop I will sharing <laughs> i'll enjoy the rest of your evening paul and thank you everyone. I, will do. The... I will do thank you very much Di diane it's really nice to speak to you yeah lovely to see you thanks paul see you lovely. soon bye-bye